Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Couple weeks and I'd go crazy, crazy. Yeah, I need you on the regular, the regular. Yeah, I need you. Yeah, I'm telling ya, I'm telling ya. Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Hi, welcome to Divas with Debbie. So today is a cold and rainy day where I am wet hair, fuzzy blanket, um, and today is, we're just going to look at one chapter exclusively, Isaiah 22, and it's interesting, I had to change how I read this passage, as Isaiah is actually really challenging me in this, it really requires me to do some studying and some research, because a lot of it is beyond my understanding, and it's not that, um, necessarily the material is uh, impossible to understand but rather it has a lot of historical stuff and references that I just don't understand so I did something that I feel like might be useful to anyone who ever watches this is I read it through once by myself and then the second time I read it through with the commentary beside it you know working through each verse and sort of outlining it in my notebook. And then I reread it again with understanding, you know, and just saw what stood out. And I read it out loud to my second reread. And then I reread it another time just in my head and jotted down some things that God was just impressing on my heart. So I'm just going to walk you through some just this one chapter, hopefully it won't be too long, and share some things that I've learned from other people and the commentaries and then also some things God was showing me, just putting on my heart. So first thing I learned is in verse one already is that Israel or Jerusalem was called the Valley of Vision by some prophets. And this is super interesting. Um, one person said that it was because it's where the people of God worshipped. And then it was like the center of the worship of God where everybody went to commune with God. And I like that idea that like where do we meet God or where we meet God is where we have vision, where we can see clearly. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, the most accurate interpretation. Who knows? That's just what I came across when I was reading but our context is this passage is talking about Jerusalem, the Valley of Vision. And it's actually against Jerusalem, which is very interesting. Um, and we have talked a little bit about the fall of Babylon yesterday. Well, here we're actually talking about the fall of Jerusalem, when Babylon overtook Jerusalem. And the context that we have here politically is we know that King Hezekiah is on the throne. And he has a number two guy whose name is Shibna, or Shebna. Um, King Hezekiah of Judah is reigning right now. And King Hezekiah was an awesome king. He was the king in, I think, Second Kings or something where over and over and over again, it says, like, in the high places, we're still up there and, like, whatever. Well, he was a good king, and he did what was right in the eyes of the word. And he actually took down the high places where those... Um, idols were being worshipped and he um, destroyed them and he, he was a good king um, and so he has a number two guy named Shebna and pretty much the city of Jerusalem is realizing they're in big trouble and how it actually took place was the city of Jerusalem was under siege by the Babylonians and it's interesting because it comments like your your leaders, this is Isaiah speaking about this um, siege. He says like, you know, your slain are not slain with the sword or dead in battle. All your leaders have fled together without the bow, oh, without the bow, they were captured. All of you who were found were captured, though they had fled far away. So kind of saying, okay, your warriors weren't so warriors, <laughs> you know, they died out of starvation or out of cowardly fleeing um, and leaving people to fend for themselves. 
in this city. So um, he talks about that. And he has this moment of just deep godly grief where he says, like, don't look at me like I'm crying right now. Like, this, don't even comfort me because it's not going to work. This is horrible. And it's interesting. He He's really distraught by seeing this, this word of God. He's so heartbroken. And I can imagine him... Isaiah, knowing, getting this glimpse into God's heart, into into the future, into what God's going to do, into what could have been, you know, he is just heartbroken because he sees what God intended Jerusalem to be and how God wants his people to act and then the reality of what is actually happening and how things are actually going down. So he's just totally distraught. And we get, you know, a little picture that this is going down. And <laughs> that's pretty vague. Uh, but we move into this image of how the city is prepping. And from a earthly standpoint, it makes sense. It says, you saw that the breaches of the city of David were many. And so you collected water of the lower pool and you counted the houses of Jerusalem and you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. You made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. So they're, they're like, okay, oh my gosh, our walls aren't secure. We need to make sure that we have water and that we're safe and secure. So they patch up their walls with materials from the houses that they took down. I mean, it, it makes sense from a worldly perspective. Um, but verse 11 gives us a key insight into how they were not preparing correctly. It says, But you did not look to him who did it, or see him who planned it long ago. Another translation says, But you did not look to your maker, to the maker, or see him who fashioned it long before. Wow! Ah! They're making all these physical preparations, but they aren't turning to God. And one of the small thoughts that just came to my head is, do they not remember Jericho? You know, their God was powerful enough to have them destroy a city just by marching around it. God does not have this fear that humans have because he knows he's in control. He's in, he's in control. <laughs> And yet these citizens of Jerusalem, his people, people who are supposed to be at the epicenter of the worship of God, like they they don't even have to travel <laughs> to the temple. They are there with the temple of God and they have access to God and yet they're turning to other methods to protect themselves. They have access to God. It's not even about access. Woo! So, anyways, they're making all the wrong preparations. And God's like, he called for weeping, verse 12, and mourning for baldness and wearing sackcloth. And what we understand about that is that's like what repentance looks like. God saying, okay, you decided to do this. Repent. Just weep and mourn because your destruction's coming. Like, come before me with this humble heart and repent. But instead, God called for repentance. Instead, they are saying, let us let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Just that mentality of, okay, let's then make the most of this and let's just, just fatten ourselves up. Live, you know, our last day, last night with gusto. Um, ooh, it just feels so out of place. Like, even earlier, Isaiah describes it as, um, you who are full of shoutings, tumultuous city, exultant town. Like, it, it just, 
is misplaced. It's awkward. It doesn't look right. It doesn't fit in the context to see these people just eating and drinking, being merry, and I can assume that there's like, you know, just this uh, morality has been thrown out the window. You know, they're like, just live, you know, YOLO, <laughs> this is it. And, and that mentality is breaking God's heart. And it almost makes me think, what if Israel had repented? What if they had humbled themselves? We see so many stories of this where, for example, Jonah comes and he uh, goes to Nineveh in Assyria and he tells them, you know, you know what? You're like not doing so hot. Repent. And they do. And God saves them, you know? And I think Israel had a chance. God gave them a chance. Even the fact that this is a prophecy. And Isaiah is saying this stuff to the people of God. And they could listen. And they don't. And their battle plan ignored God. And even their... their I guess, sub celebration ignored God's attitude. It was contrary to what God was feeling. And so God says something, which is interesting. And he speaks specifically to Hezekiah's helper, um, the king's chief steward. So Hezekiah was a good king. So it makes sense why God is not addressing Hezekiah, who is leading his people well. Um, like, who's, you know, a good leader. Whether or not the people are submitting to him or listening to him is a whole other thing. But he's talking to Shebna. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But Shebna is not obeying. And in fact, he's kind of like the people. He uses his authority con to construct a tomb. Like a really fancy tomb. And his money and authority are leveraged for that in this time where... Where Isaiah is saying, people are going to be in exile, you're going to get thrown out, like, don't, don't get comfy. <laughs> and Shebna's getting comfy out of defiance and just ignorance, thinking, like, we're going to be here. So I'm going to, you know, get comfy. And adding to that, Shebna, I feel like that making of the tomb is almost symbolic. Like, he made his own fancy tomb. Like, in his disobedience, he was creating, he was, like, digging his grave, you know, saying, like, I will defy the living God, <laughs> thinking it's not going to come back on him, but he's actually just digging his own grave here. Um, and instead, God says, like, almost sarcastically, he said, Behold, the Lord will hurl you away, O oh, you strong man. He will seize firm hold on you and will whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There you shall die and there shall be your glorious chariots, you, you shame of your master's house. So he's basically saying, oh, you think you're so strong. Oh, you think you know better. Well, I'm God. Like, let's not forget the strength of our God. Like, God is strong and he just takes God is stronger. Not only is he strong, he is stronger. He just takes this guy and he's like, have fun <laughs> with your disobedience. And he says, in your place, like in Shebna's place, he's going to put a new leader. And he identifies that person by name. He says, I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. He says, I will clothe him with your robe and bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. So again, we're reminded God is the one who gives authority. God is the one who appoints people. God is in control. And he's choosing not what man chooses. Again, he's choosing someone who he identifies as a servant. You know, this, I was thinking about that word servant and how like a servant submits and a servant listens, and a servant's actions are dictated and informed by his master. And God, in this time where he's saying something and his people are doing the opposite, he, he's 
always drawn to hearts that have chosen submission, joyful submission. And so he chooses this man, Eliakim or Eliakim, and he says, I'm going to set him up as a father of Jerusalem. And I'm going to give him the key. And what he lacks is locked. What he opens, he is opened. And again, this is uh, twofold. You know, this is talking about Eliakim, but it moves into this messianic prophecy too. That, sorry, this is going a little long. Uh, messianic prophecy. So he's saying like, what I close, what I close, what I open, I open. Um, and then he goes into this. I mean, that's, you know, directly talking about Jesus. I think I meant, wrote, jotted down some scriptures in Revelation. Yeah, Revelation 3, 7 and 1, 8 just talks about like, you know, when Jesus is opening the door, whatever. Um, and, you know, perhaps like keys to the kingdom to that concept that God gives authority to Peter too. Like, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Super cool. Um, but... All that to say, we get this very interesting image of a peg. And honestly, I do not remember reading this. Even though I know I've read this passage before, I don't remember this image of Jesus described as a peg. And I like him here, but it's twofold. It's talking about a like him, but it's also talking about Jesus. And what we see in a like him, we can learn about who Jesus is. And so it says, um, and I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring, an issue, every small vessel, from the cups to all the flag flagons. Um, so we see he's saying, okay, I'm going to put a peg here in the house of God, and it's going to be a peg that holds the honor like a throne of God. Um, and we just think about like how Jesus wants to bear us. He wants to bear us up. And I'm based off of what I learned today. I don't know that much, but in the houses in Jerusalem, they didn't have, um, shelving units. They had pegs and they would hang stuff on it. And it didn't matter what you hung on it. What mattered was that it was strong and that it was going to be secure. And so you could have the fanciest vessel, most beautiful thing, and hang it on a peg and have it fall and crash. And that destruction is just as equal to the destruction of a smaller vessel. And what mattered was the fastening of the peg, the security of the peg. And God's saying, like, I'm going to put a good peg here <laughs> and it's going to be secure. And on this, I'm going to hang my honor. Like, I'm going to, it's, it's dependable enough that I'm going to say, this is where my honor is going to rest. And again, he's talking about Elikin, but he's also talking about Jesus. And he, he talks about um, Shebna and what his peg is essentially fated to. And he says, in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way, and it will be cut down and fall, and the load that was on it will be cut off. For the Lord has spoken. So it, it really matters what peg you hang your life on. Are you going to hang your life on and, and put the weight of your life on something that is unstable? Um, so just some takeaways. Again, this is longer. Ah, this is really long. One, um, like, where are you hanging your life? Two, let's remember that God is a God of forgiveness. Like, he cares so much about repentance. With a humble heart and a repentant heart, he's going to listen to us. He's going to turn and heal us and save us. Um, but we need that repentance heart. Repentant heart. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to stop here, but have a good day.